both libraries and economics education throughout the school systems in Arkansas. One of my favorite stories about Bessie Moore is Economics Arkansas needed some money. So she invited all the big important bankers and business people to a luncheon at the hotel room. They walked in and sat down. She locked the doors behind them, dropped the keys down the front of her blouse and said, when I have this much money, you can leave. <laughs> and that worked for her. It never worked for me. But, um, and so that, I mean, that she has made, it, it, she made it her life's work to see that the children in Arkansas are given the skills they need to be productive adults. I have tried to continue that and, and I'm very fortunate. I have my kids for a number of years in a row. We start each year with me asking them, what do you want to learn this year? The GT curriculum is flexible enough that they can have a lot of endpoint, a lot of choice, a lot of voice in their curriculum. Last year it range from we'd really like to learn to cook Chinese food, Lord help us, all the way to I'd like to learn to sew, and that turned into projects. Now, when you have 50 kids who want to learn things as widely varied as those, funding becomes an issue. And so one of the ways that we work through that is the kids become entrepreneurs, and they come up with projects. We had a second place winner of the Youth Entrepreneurship Showcase. And then my third graders sold, I have to remember which class did which project, they sold um, spooky st suckers and that paid for their materials for their economics projects and they also bought hats, gloves and scarves for our care closet. Then fifth grade, in addition to being part of the Youth Entrepreneurship Showcase, also became entrepreneurs and sold stockings and they helped fund our little food pantry. And so we, and then fourth grade does um, hugograms. We send Valentine's all through the school. And I won't be doing that this year because you can't send candy. But that, that's one of the things that teaches them those skills, not only in decision making and entrepreneurship, but also in personal finance. And there's a study that came out a couple of years ago that said all of your personal finance habits are developed by the time you're seven years old. And so if we don't get started early with those kids, they won't be able to be productive citizens when they're grown and taking care of all of us in the nursing home. So that, that's what my, we did a bunch of different things throughout the year, but those were the main things we did. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, so our, I'm just gonna use my notes because I was afraid I was gonna forget what I was gonna talk about. Um, my project was Entrepreneurship Through the Eyes of a Child, and it was based on the book, uh, Billy Sure Kid Entrepreneur. And so my students absolutely loved the book, and it had so many different things in it. And I'd actually taught the book the year before, and then I was developing curriculum, and I was like, this is a perfect one to use for the Bessie. And so um, I had written it to help them with their career aspirations and just to see what kinds of characteristics an entrepreneur actually would possess. Um, they were able to get a lot of economic literacy, anything from, you know, Billy Schur was the chief executive officer of his own company, and then he had his best friend was his chief financial officer. So we had to go over, you know, what that actually meant and all the different things with it, and they were able to develop a lot of um, new knowledge based on that. One activity that they did that they absolutely loved was a make a case activity that 
they actually acted as kind of detectives and going through infographics about economics and they were looking for the specific characteristics that, they, that were described. And so that was a really good way to really get them to read and I talked to them about that they're using their spy eyes because they wanted to really dig deep into what was there. They also were able to create marketing campaigns and then they did a little research project on each of them using um, the Toy Trailblazers books, which are, is a series of books based on entrepreneurs that have created different things like Play-Doh or Legos or different things. And then we also used a book, the books called Food Dudes. <laughs> so that was like the KFC um, creator or Chick-fil-A and all the different things. And they really enjoyed it. So they created one page, um, one pagers they're called, where they actually summarized all their different things about their specific entrepreneur. And so they actually got to dig deeper into those people also. So it was a really exciting experience for the kids. And we had planned some more things, but then, you know, COVID hit. So we had to cut it off where we ended. But um, it was just a really neat opportunity. And I was very excited to receive the award. Congratulations. Good job, I'm sorry. Yes, we are both were told to bring our checks. Mm -hmm. oh. So they're both a thousand. So what yes. will you both use the money for? Well, it's actually for us. The way oh, it's yeah. Put, yes, it's a personal award. Yes. So I plan to use it for Christmas shopping. <laughs> that's a I good plan. Grandchildren, you know, right. that's the fun thing to do. So. And I'm buying myself computers. Yeah, so. <laughs> hey, those are both great things. So yes. congratulations. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Okay, Coach Tellick, just as a set real quickly, the, this year with COVID having created quite the issue since March, football really wasn't something that was allowed to do on our campus with the youth earlier in the year. And it was brought to my attention that it may be in jeopardy for basketball as well. So a conversation developed. <clears throat> I think uh, some moms and dads in the community pulled together some football teams uh, and worked with AAO and maybe some some other schools or other uh, communities in Northwest Arkansas, the conversation came up about basketball. So Coach Tellick and I met with some folks the other day for a preliminary discussion. I think uh, Dr. Hensy uh, was also part of that later on. So Coach Tellick, if you'd like to visit with the board about potential use of facilities in the in the district for Thank you, sir. Uh, board, I appreciate your time tonight. And uh, a couple things. You'll all notice that uh, you've all got a couple new shields uh, for your safety and uh, your protection and of yours and others. Uh, I've also given you my business card uh, for a couple reasons. One, you might need to call me sometime about tickets or whatever the case may be. Also, if you look at the back of my business card, it says connecting kids. And that's what we do. And so, uh, historical here, a uh, five years ago, uh, Dr. Cleveland, Dr. Allen, and I sat upstairs on a Friday afternoon in March, and we decided to do seventh grade athletics, something that no one else was in the area was doing except we're going to do it, like in three or four months, which was the hard part. Uh, those same kids now that were the seventh graders that we started are now seniors. And so we've come a long ways with our seventh grade. All schools in the area are doing it now, but it all started really upstairs. So we like to connect kids. So our next step, we think, is to try to do some things, connect with groups in our city, in our community, uh, through the school district. Um, so we've had some conversation with local groups. We started this past year with soccer. We we're going to have a soccer league through Parks and Rec with our middle schools. Well, the virus shut that down. So fast forward to in the last month, we have conversation with uh, uh, AAO, with Parks and Rec, with Sonic, and others regarding basketball. Because well, I think we all agree that we need to keep our kids connected. And right now, because of COVID and the virus and things, we're not allowing teams to do any kind of practicing in our gyms, uh, whether it's even our softball fields, our baseball fields, our, soft, our 
football fields, we're limiting practice. And so, but we, how do we keep our kids connected? And so the conversation has begun to uh, seek your approval and your thoughts on uh, creating basketball teams either through Sonic or potentially through a plan that our basketball coaches have developed with Dr. Hensey is that maybe we would play, we would practice basketball in our four middle schools, which after talking to Mr. White, Jeremy White, that would limit the amount of sanitizing we'd have to do either later that night or the next day. So we go from 18 elementaries to potentially the feeder programs into four middle schools. We practice and then we'll play potentially at AAO. And now that Parks and Rec is opening up and we'll have a league starting in on January 11th, there's options that we might have AAO teams, Parks and Rec teams, or just general teams, school teams that connect our kids. And so um, we've met with our basketball coaches, our high school coaches, and uh, Simeon has come up with a plan regarding practice and some things we can do. So Simeon, share some of your thoughts if you would please. Thank you guys, I appreciate Dr. Cleveland, Coach Stelic, and the school board for allowing me to be a voice for the Springdale School District kids. I really do appreciate that. Uh, Coach Stelic really clarified it. I, I saw on the agenda where it said, we are trying to create a partnership with AAO for youth basketball. Well, we're not necessarily looking to create a partnership with any one entity. What we're here tonight to ask you for is access for our kids to be able to continue to be developed and to continue to become future Wildcats and future Bulldogs. And whether the league we decide to go to is AAO, we'll make those decisions. Is it Parks and Rec? We'll make those decisions. Is it through the Sonics Basketball Association? We'll make those decisions as well. But what we're asking for is the school district kids to have access to school district facilities to be able to practice and prepare for whatever league it is that the athletic department decides is best for the students to participate and compete in. So this whole idea of access, why is it important? I want to tell you a quick story. Uh, there was a young guy in April, on April 4th, 1994, he turned the television on in the Bahamas. And on that TV screen, he saw a team called the Arkansas Razorbacks playing basketball. Never heard of a Razorback, didn't know where Fayetteville, Arkansas was. And I think he might have seen a guy that looked like him somewhere on the TV screen. <laughs> so. These, these, this team called the Razorbacks wins this national championship, and this 13-year-old kid is like, man, that is so cool, that is so awesome. Well, lo and behold, this 13-year-old kid has the opportunity to move to Fayetteville, Arkansas a year later. He flies to Drake Field, Lance, Drake Field, and he's moved to Fayetteville, Arkansas, lives with a host family, and he starts to go to school at Fayetteville Christian. And a, a former classmate and teammate is actually back there. That's a former Fayetteville Christian guy. Uh, this 13-year-old kid spends two years at Fayetteville Christian in high school, educating himself, learning the game of basketball, has an opportunity to go to John Brown University on a full athletic basketball scholarship because he was given an opportunity to have access, something he didn't have in the Bahamas. That same 13-year-old kid graduated with a double major in digital media and broadcasting, went on to work in the media industry, went on to get his master's degree in sports management, went on to work at the University of Arkansas and get his doctoral degree in sport management while being an assistant coach for the University of Arkansas Razorback women's basketball program. That 13-year-old kid is that man standing in front of you today because somebody said it was important enough for me to have access to a basketball gym. So for me, this is personal. We have the opportunity to change kids' lives by giving them access, just by giving them access. So I wanna take a few seconds to just show you this quick video and talk about why, what's happening in youth sports, why this is so important to continue to give kids access because a trend is happening in youth sports that we as educators have the opportunity to change. And we have to do it quickly because 
the number of kids participating in sports is continuing, continuing to drop at a dramatic rate. And we have to do something as educators in our district to do something about our kids. I'm Kerry Champion, along with Lakers legend Kobe Bryant. So, Kobe, we just saw that latest public service announcement highlighting the fact that many kids retiring from sports, they need not do that. So why is it so important that kids stay with sports? Well, it, it teaches you a lot of valuable lessons. You know, aside from, you know, the, the, the physical, you know, being fit, and aside from, like, the mental health benefits that you get from playing sports, there's also an emotional component, too. I mean, sports is the greatest metaphor we have for life. You know, teaching you things like how to deal with anxiety, how to deal with, um, uh, uh, you know, communicating with each other, leadership, performing under pressure, all those very, very valuable lessons. Okay, so tell me about your involvement with Project Play. Well, it's something I really became passionate about because of their mission of how do you make the game more engaging? How do you enable kids to play? You know, we live in an environment now where everything is extremely structured for children. And sports used to be something that kids go out and do for fun. Yeah. But now it's become so regimented uh, where parents are starting to kind of inject their own experiences or past failures, if you will, onto their children, and it just takes the fun out of it. So you guys see what, what some of the issues are that we're dealing with in this culture of youth sports, uh, where it's become so specialized, where everything is you have to be the greatest MLB player at eight years old. <laughs> you're going to be the next LeBron James when you're nine. And parents and youth sports organizations have started to, to use kids really to make money. It's a $19 billion industry right now. So we and my fellow coaches, it's our responsibility to take control of our kids' future and really use the education that we've received and the training that we've received, received to really turn youth sports back to what it was in the beginning. So we're asking you, <laughs> it's just to give us access. Our superintendent is on board. Our athletic director is on board. Our middle school principals, they're on board. And I know the parents and the kids are on board. Nick, he just walked out, but I have parents. I'm a parent of a Springdale School District kid. And we got about 20 of them online right now watching, <laughs> waiting to see what happens. So I appreciate you guys giving us a few minutes of your time. And I'd be happy to ask any questions about the proposal in front of me. Lord, do y'all have any? Well, the proposal that we're talking about tonight is specifically just to be able to use the gyms. And that's it. That's it. We just need access and so then, our kids can try out four gyms, the four middle school gyms. Then the decision process on how we move forward with Sonics, AAO, Rec, all that stuff. Who's, how are we, how are we determining? We're going to meet tomorrow with uh, Sonic, with the Sonic rep. We talked to Chad Wolf at Parks and Rec, but we're going to have a, bit, a meeting tomorrow morning to see how we can compromise between Sonics and maybe some ideas that uh, Simi and our coaches have. Uh, but we really can't go anywhere until we, until we have access to gyms. So it starts here. We can't even have tryouts. Access is not the pro I'm not worried about the access. I'm worried about a program that, like the Sonics, that's been around for 15 years, that's been doing this kind of stuff behind the scenes, taking care of kids, allowing them to, to play ball, providing the funding and the financing and all that. I want to make sure that they're not just ushered out the door. That's, that's they, part of our conversation tomorrow with James Dean. James Dean? Yes. 
is anybody else with the Sonics going to be a part of that? Uh, so far, we've talked to John Dillinger, and he's directed me to uh, James Dean, and so that's part of our conversation tomorrow. And I'll add that Sonics was never asked to be removed from this conversation. The, well, I hope the, not. I the original proposal sure. has always been, and I've had conversations with Jeremy Price, Heather Hunsucker, Tommy Deffelbaugh, and Kimberly Jenkins, who are all on the executive board of the Sonics organization. We just got to make sure all the players are in the room together. Everybody's and... always been invited to be in the room. Okay. And I, I would love for Sonics to continue to be in the room. <laughs> I'm sure I you can. would. There's a nice pot of money there that they <laughs> We that they need help. their help. We need everybody in the community's help to make this thing happen. This isn't us saying that we're completely going to take control of this thing. We need community partners in order to make this thing happen. But like Coach Stelic said, Nothing is going to happen first and foremost until we know kids can actually practice. You can say you want to play in Sonics or AAU as much as you want, but if Coach Emerson can't practice with his kids, it doesn't matter what league is out there. We, we're not going to send our kids to AAU to get their heads beat in or to Sonics or anywhere else. Well, I'm happy to make a motion to allow the kids access to uh, the gyms. I've never had a problem with that. I mean, I, I thought it was idiotic that AAA said we couldn't let people do that. So I've got no problem with our kids. They're our kids. They're Springdale kids. They ought to be able to get on our baseball fields, our football fields, our basketball gyms. They, it's all publicly funded stuff for our kids. So our kids should be able to use the dead gym facilities. So I have absolutely no problem with that. I'll make a motion to do that right now. I'll second. I after I said you did that. I do have a question. Where so the who govern I mean why why who's saying we can't have kids in in the gym, outside organization in the gym? Is that a triple A? I, I can help with that thing. Okay. Originally we were told that we need to have our facilities just be for the students that are participating with competition. So the 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 back off of that is we're not having competition in those gyms at this age, the competition will take place at an off-site location, but the practice opportunities should be made available or could be made available for, for practice. Gotcha. But having people come in to the main gyms at the high schools and the junior highs for the little league would be very difficult for us to manage and clean, but the practices would not. So okay. it's made it more palatable in that regard. Gotcha. So as long Sorry, well, we have to have staff available for all this, and where's the liability for us? Well, we're toward immune, so uh, as far as liability, it's just as if, you know, students come to school. But in regard to staff, we'll have staff cleaners and custodians that'll take care of the gyms after. I think Mr. White, I saw him, he may even have the plan prepared this evening to discuss if you'd like to hear. I mean, they're already there. They're there yeah. in the evening, yeah. yeah. Have to move the schedule eight. around to clean the. Gym. They're still in the building, and they can, after we finish up with practice, they can be sent back to the gym. Yeah. And we went to the four middle schools because four is a lot better situation than 18 elementaries. And the good thing that's happened in the last probably week is that Parks and Rec has now decided to open up. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to start a volleyball league. They're going to start a basketball league uh, on uh, January 11th. And so there's more opportunities for. So this here, this motion being seconded, will help give us some opportunities to create more opportunities for kids at the fourth, fifth, and potentially sixth grade. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I mean, I'm for it. I, I think we need to promote as much as we can opportunities for kids, and even if it goes beyond what the city offers. I mean, we, we have a 23,000 kid opportunity that we can connect kids connect kids together so we got the best audience out there and the best participation opportunities out there this should be a no-brainer I'll, I'll give you an example we got to work out logistics but it yeah, should sure. be my son got invited to practice at Fayetteville's gym last year the Fayetteville coaches invited him from Springdale to come down there to practice with them on Sundays because we didn't have those opportunities here in Springdale now you know wait my son going to play Fayetteville <laughs> but <laughs> the fact that they were bold enough <laughs> to do that because we didn't have the opportunity and access for our kids to do those types of things. We need to, we need to be able to do that for our kids. Mm -hmm. well, we got a second. 
We have a motion by Mr. Hutchinson and a second by Mr. Emerson to allow to open our middle school gyms for uh, practices. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks for your time. Before you go, please make sure all players are at the table. I know all the players involved here, and basketball is. I'm sorry. I mean, that's that's, that's my thing too. That's um, my pictures on the wall over there in the gym, and <laughs> so is John Dillinger and Chad Wolf and a bunch of these folks that are players. And I just want to make sure that everybody is represented, and we don't try to monkey too much with things the way they've they've been. So that's how we operate the whole time. Okay, I just want to make sure that I'll be watching. <laughs> we'll, 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 try to, we'll try to report back the whole board about how things are developing. So, and, and uh, Mr. Emerson, I guess you're, are you coaching a team? Mm -hmm. That'd be awesome. Okay, so you'll have first hand. Mm -hmm. very, very good. Yep. Okay, uh, Ms. Cook, would you like me to move forward? With Please. That? Okay, yes ma'am. Uh, next is just the property update, and it's really quick. I'll probably be the, the quickest presenter of the night. Uh, I've provided all the information from our last work session to Mr. Tom Reed, and he is preparing to provide a proposal for you all uh, on what the cost will be to appraise the properties that were identified. And it was the, the property in Elm Springs, it was Grange property, Fishback, and uh, Washington Building. Those were the main ones that I understood from the board to uh, review. Uh, 56th Street is not, and uh, well, the Bayari property will also going to get up. Uh, appraisal for. So I'm sorry I've left that one out. So we should have that opportunity. Uh, as soon as he sent it to me, I'll forward it to you all and we'll move forward. Okay. Thank you so much. And the next thing, I believe, on the agenda, the, no, the remote learning. I was skipping yes. one. Yes, ma'am. Uh, as you know, and thank you all for, for listening to the uh, request to uh, provide an opportunity to practice this remote learning on October the 16th and 19th. The effort here is to provide the students with catch-up time, passion project time, all that, and do it remotely on a Monday and Friday, which kind of bookends. You know, we didn't get a fall break. Kids didn't, teachers get, didn't, moms and dads didn't. So it gives this opportunity to do that. Also, it gives the uh, teachers and the administrators an opportunity, I use that word a lot, but to really push and work on our lessons that we're gonna see a little bit later that the curriculum team is developing along with, with teaching staff and, and instructional facilitators. So thank you for that. We just wanna be able to change on our master, on our academic calendar, that these two dates will be remote learning dates, teaching and learning, just like we have in November. So anyway, I really appreciate you allowing us to do that. So will, will there be anybody in the buildings on those two days? Teachers, administrators, no. Okay. No. So we're, we're really trying to get them out to really practice it. Yep. Uh, you know, if I had a question today, what if we have a snow day? How will that look? Our idea is it October will 16th and 19th. be just the same, <laughs> right. And, and it gives us all an, a good understanding of what the expectations will be. Mm -hmm. So Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And Ms. Cook, I know all of you experienced the, uh, the ASBA Region 1. Zoom meeting the other night? Yes. <laughs> um, Kevin Murray. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't there. I missed. Well, it was a, a couple of hours. I think uh, you earned two boardsmanship hours, I believe. Good job, Mr. Ombi. <laughs> you know, I was looking at my board hours today, and, um, you know, I missed an opportunity in my two awards. I'm a master board member. I didn't even know that. And an excellent board member with my training hours. I didn't even know that. We, I didn't, there was no celebration. We all knew that. We did. We celebrated without you. <laughs> Congratulations, Thank Mr. Olympi. That was like five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, if I missed that. And I didn't get the pay rate. Right. If I missed that, I apologize. Well, I think you did. Oh, okay. You did. It's an extra zero. Okay. Added to the end. So it was zero. And I believe we also have the winter conference coming up. My understanding is it's going to be Zoom. Ms. Smalling tried to find out today the total cost of what that'll be. 
from what I understood, it was going to be the same as the normal cost, just without the hotel rooms and all. But being Zoom, they don't have anything out just yet of what the the um, the cost could be Sorry. per person. So coming just, soon. You may all receive it the same date we do. So if uh, Mr. Hudson may know right now. I don't know. I, I'm assuming I'll find out about the same time everybody else does. Okay. I mean, the next thing we can do as a board is to become a master board, and that means all of us have to be basically have our master board certification, which is, I think, 50 hours? Like I that. think so. So it may take a little while because we got a brand new one on the board. But I, that's believe, I believe Mr. Clinton, Mr. Yeah, Clinton Bell has already up. worked yeah, his way up to really many good. hours. Well, he's not coming up. That's our next, as a took, board, that's our next big thing. It just thing took me 10 do. years, so. <laughs> But we need to um, assign or nominate a delegate for um, the winter conference. Nick, would you like to? Sure. Randy and I kind of nominated you, so sounds, we were. Sounds good. Well, I, I serve as a board of directors, so it would be best if someone other than me yeah, served fine. in that capacity. Yep. And she's, she's someone done else it. would like to. Do we need to fill out that survey monkey thing that we got on email, or is that? Yes. Yeah. This is an attachment that survey monkey of who that is. So this is, all this is different. It? No, this is for just the delegate. For has the delegate. To. Okay. Survey monkey that we got for the regional meeting. Yes, fill out. Okay. That's how they're going to connect that you were on and you get your hours. Okay. Just fill that out. I thought this was the same thing. No, it's yeah. I, I guess the question is: Is Mr. Emerson going to complete that survey monkey yes. to sign up yes. or? Okay. Yeah, well, I won't do it at all. Then. Okay, I'll do it. Very good. Do we Excellent. need to nominate you? I mean, like, I want to vote. I think I just was nominated. <laughs> Does it need to be an official vote or anything? Need I don't think so. I think you just decide who just it is. Just decide somebody. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, sir. Come on. We want to. I, know. I think that I will official. be on the uh, docket for getting it on the, the ground floor of the executive uh, committee also, of the secretary treasurer. Oh, excellent. So I'll be working my way up that chain of command. We did a good job the other day on, on the Zoom. It's really difficult. <laughs> you got to start somewhere, right? Yep. She did a good job. Well, thank you, Ms. Cook. If you'd like for me to continue, I'd like to introduce Mr. Damon Donnell. If you haven't been uh, paying a lot of attention to the Facebook and to our YouTube channel and all, Mr. Donnell, among many other uh, employees of the district, have reached out to many people, and we have some tremendous local partnerships. You know, y'all were talking about Sonics and everybody else. There are ridiculous amounts of partnerships uh, that have been prepared in the, in our communities because our community loves your district so much. So, Mr. I really like these a lot. I do too. I agree. Uh, I'd just like to continue the conversation that Dr. Henze uh, started here tonight with uh, connecting and community partnerships. And I'd just like to say that, wow, we have some, we are very blessed to have some really fantastic uh, community partners in Springdale. Um, as I mentioned at the last board meeting, one of my favorite quotes is, alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. Tonight I'd like to continue to spotlight additional community partners and say thank you for what these partnerships mean to students, parents, families, and in the community. So first I'd like to uh, recognize Superior Automotive Group for donating 300 hand sanitizer pumps to students and families. Uh, Joanne's Fabric for donating 550 masks. And if you haven't seen those masks that they, that they did, they were phenomenal. I mean, they, each one was individualized. I mean, it was really a special deal. Also, um, the United Way for donating $1,000. Next, I'd like to, uh, uh, to um, say thank you to McDonald's. Do I have the clicker here? I do, don't I? This was um, a really neat thing. We were able to send out enough free breakfast cards for every staff member in, in the Springdale School District. So I want to say thank you to McDonald's for doing that. And it was a, if it was a, a drink or a, um, a coffee, and then also a hash brown and a sausage or egg McMuffin for every staff member. Also Terry Clark with Burger King uh, he started this last year with a 5,000 donation for families and, uh, and students in, in uh, Springdale, and he continued that again this year. I want to say thank you for that. Trudy Credit Union for donating 
$10,000 for students and families in Springdale. And Walmart, this was kind of neat. I got to pick on Jeremy just for a minute on this. Walmart called me and said, hey, you know, we'd like to donate these six pallets of school supplies. And so I picked up the phone to call Jeremy and I said, hey, and he goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, really, I need, I need some space. And he goes, all right, what you need? It, it, uh, so I told him I needed six pallets, you know, to put six pallets and he went, no. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He said, whatever it takes to, to help kids. So we were able to uh, send out an email and we gave all that away in two days, didn't we? Yeah, two days. So it was a great app to school. You may not answer any more calls for me. <laughs> okay, and then also the Walker Foundation for um, $50,000 to students and families. And uh, the Northwest Arkansas Food Bank, we're super excited about this. We had um, two, a, a school and the district received $25,000 each for food insecurity. So. Pretty amazing things happening. Um, do you all have any questions about any of that? Is yes. there a like a, a district account where all this stuff goes? It does, does it go to a special so, place or what's? Yes, what there is. Think? Kelly can answer that a little better than I can, but um, a lot of times we put that in the, in the social worker fund and then that goes out for families for, I mean, it can go for groceries or to help pay bills or, or um, transportation, any of those types of things, clothing, food, uh, we made a transition this year on our food, actually toward the end of last year, where we used to go to Walmart, pick up food for families, take it to their house and deliver it, but Walmart was kind enough to allow us to buy one um, uh, account. And membership. Yes, and then we just change the address each time, and then we just shoot food right to families' That's doorsteps. Awesome. Oh, wow. And we can usually, if, a, we, if we know a family needs food that day, we can usually get it to them that day. That's wonderful. It's, it's, and it, it's safer too. Our social workers don't have to expose themselves at the, at the house mm -hmm. when they um, you know, deliver the food. So then it's just a lot safer that way also. That's so a great all question. 30, and you get one, 32 all schools have access, access to... <laughs> yes, to through that. our social workers, they have access to those funds, yes. Mm -hmm. What about like, we've received a lot of things throughout, you know, because of COVID, whether it be mask or, or school supplies or money. Are we seeing, I mean, are we uh, not keeping track, but are, is most of it already being delivered or do we still have stuff sitting places? Everything that I know of has been delivered out. The okay. mask, uh, the NAACP, you may remember, also donated, I think it was around a thousand masks and we all of that stuff's already gone out. We try to get it out as quick as we can, but we just don't have the space to store a lot of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. You just rotate it from school to school? Well, um, actually, I think uh, Joanne's Fabric and NAACP actually wanted to know uh, the schools that had mm -hmm. uh, like high poverty. Okay. And so then we uh, we gave them a list and they picked. I you know we they right. picked the school. Okay. So. Okay. Cool. cool. Great. Any other questions? Okay. I think I'm gonna introduce. Uh, Hold on Dr. just a second. Yes. Hold on a second, Mr. Ronell. Yes. <clears throat> you know, in the property update, I probably should have said this, but we just received the final word from the hospital about the property so we're going to be setting a closing date really quickly so they accepted Which, that yes wonderful that's good yes the 265,000 so we'll, we'll get that done uh, as soon as the title company can take care of it and got to thank Mr. Emerson for writing it original so thank you for doing those extra things Mr. Emerson that you've done for us Miss Kendra she reviewed I believe today maybe responded today so we'll try to get it knocked out then maybe you'll have some space absolutely fantastic <laughs> Thank you guys. Hi, can y'all hear me? Yes. I can't talk through this thing. So, um, Dr. Cleveland, um, this is my first time to address you. So, hey. Dr. Cleveland and board. Um, the vision for grants in Springdale Public Schools is to provide the Springdale educational community with information on grant availability as well as grant writing expertise to further fund educational opportunities for our students. We know a huge piece of um, providing this opportunity for students lies within support services and the work that that department does. So I'm happy to announce, is that my earring? It's <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to announce um, that we have received a COPS grant. It is through the um, Department of Justice and it's a three-year um, grant for $435,000. 
Um, and this is really focused on threat assessment. So it's through their, um, one of their programs that really focuses on threat assessment. Our goal is review, revise, maintain. Mm -hmm. So looking at that to hire a safety liaison that can come in and work with our safety team on making sure we have a threat assessment um, criteria and that we have um, threat assessment done on every single school within the district and then we utilize that data to revise and maintain all of our safety protocols, um, anything that we need to put in place. So, um, and then our late breaking news was Friday, um, Dr. Cleveland and I received an email um, that we received a $750,000 three-year grant through um, the same department, Department of Justice, um, but this one's for Stop the School Violence Program. Um, and it has the same exact goal, which is a threat assessment team. Um, and so the difference in the two grants is the second one also provides a layer of professional development for our staff members. Um, that includes mental health professional development, um, training on threat assessment, that sort of thing um, for, for our assistant principals at, at each site. So it's a capacity building really model for three years. And what does that capacity look like at the end of three years for the district? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, any questions about that? Oh, that's great. great job. So, when you say with the COPS grant, when you say hire a safety liaison, is that like a temporary person? Yes, yeah, so it or? would be for three years. Okay. Yes. Cool. Does any of that money buy like toys, hardware, like uh, <laughs> yeah. cameras and? It does. It does. So, so we have flexibility within it. Some of the things that we put within the grant protocol, and I think you have it in your packet. Um, we put things like cameras, um, looking at, oh, help me out. Um, what are the sense, smart, smart sensors smart. within, within restrooms that can sense things like vaping or, um, loud noises, um, working with the, um, district, Safe, it's not safe to tell, it's um, see something, say something right. campaign. Mm -hmm. um, the second one provides the see something, say something campaign for the technology for phones, for the computer, for the parent trainings, for community trainings, um, and for interpreters at those trainings so that we ensure we have everything in multiple languages. So yes, some toys are within that. We have a, a line item for like equipment and as we, what we kind of said in the grant is, as we do the review, as we do the safety assessment, then we want to align what we purchase based on what we see in those. So we gave them some ideas up front, but we really want to use our data to drive our decisions. Great. Yes. So exciting. Go. Right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Lyons. Your, your work's very evident in these two grants, especially your part-time work. <laughs> Seems like you're doing full time work. Yes, yes. Did you find your earring? <laughs> Just one thing, you know, Ms. Preston, you talk about equity. We want to make sure that we have equity in our among our elementary schools in regard to camera systems and so that's that's one of our big pushes. So anyway. Okay, Ms. Cook. It appears it's time for Miss Fink. Miss Fink, Miss Tisher, okay. So I can move the microphone. Good evening, board. The Department of Instruction is excited to present to you this evening just a few items in our section. Um, first, I want to give an update on the collaborative work that we're doing with all of our instructional facilitators across the district. You may remember from previous meetings that our instructional uh, facilitator collaborative is led by our department and also the district instructional specialist in conjunction with our school principals. So we're really focusing with our instructional facilitators and across all of the buildings um, in our district on organizational energy. And I know you all have probably seen the arrows before. Um, as you know, Springdale Public Schools is a very large mechanism and I often say when I'm presenting that I feel like it's like a giant grandfather clock and when you open it, you have all these tiny cogs and wheels and screws and they all have to be moving just the right way for the clock to operate properly. And that's what I think of when I look at these 
organizational energy arrows. If we're all going in different directions, we're never going to move forward. And so we work very hard to work on a consistent message across our district and to all be working towards the same goals. Just to revisit um, the goal itself and the purpose of our collaborative, our goal is to build a collaborative learning community to network, connect, and expand our work. And what we're really trying to hone in on is some major shared beliefs that we all agree upon as a district so we can all be turning those arrows towards the same directions. Our purpose is to establish that network of collaboration, not just within buildings, but across buildings. Because again, 31 buildings, and we all need to be going in the same direction. And so the collaboration will allow our IFs to partner with teachers to do those two things, to use a consistent lesson design and delivery process to engage our learners, whether they're on-site or remote, and then to be using our lessons to enhance our district curriculum. So I found this quote the other day from a superintendent in Washington State, and I absolutely love it. It says, children are the priority, change is the reality, and collaboration is the strategy. And Dr. Cleveland always says when he's presenting that collaboration trumps isolation every time. And in a district like ours, we must all work together daily to continue our mission and vision. This year in our Springdale Collaborative, whether we're working with our instructional specialists, our instructional facilitators, our principals, our teachers, we're really focusing on these five C's. And the first one is to be connected. Um, as a school district, we must be connected. We often refer back to our logo that we just um, released last year and we talk about a tree um, with our student in the center, but we're also like a forest. And if you know about trees and their roots, roots communicate underground and they speak to one another and trees actually feed each other. And they even nurse uh, trees that are sick back to health through their root systems. And so we talk about being connected as a district. Also, the creation of a culture of care, which Springdale is known for, and I think there's already been tremendous evidence of that this evening, but we wanna make sure that we have a culture of care um, across our district and all of our buildings. We really want to enhance collaboration, both horizontally and vertically, and again, across all 31 buildings. Right now we're really focusing on courage. Being an educator is a courageous profession pre-pandemic. Um, it takes a lot to be a teacher and right now courage is kind of driving us in this process. We talk a lot about not only courage but trust and vulnerability. And right now we're living in a really vulnerable time and we're all leaning on each other and just um, navigating through this new landscape together. And then obviously continuous learning, which those of you who have been on the board or know about Springdale Public Schools, we're all lifelong learners. And now more than ever, we kind of talk about how the playing field right now is very level. We all feel like first year teachers. It doesn't matter what seat we occupy. Um, I'm an assistant superintendent. I've been in Springdale Public Schools for over 20 years. I feel like a first year teacher. Um, and I should. And if I didn't, there would be something wrong with me. Um, we're all working together to find our way through and to serve our kids in the best way possible. And I just can't say enough positive things about our instructional facilitators, our specialists, our principals, our teachers, all of our support staff, every department. We've really all pulled together this year and I think we're doing some pretty amazing things. So I talked a little bit about the shared beliefs that we're all working to establish. And I won't go in depth in all of these categories, but I do want to touch on the major broad sweeping categories. So our goal is to allow our buildings, our building staffs to reflect on where they are in each of these areas and to allow instructional facilitators and teachers to be able to work together to personalize where their own growth areas fall. And, um, you know, we do feel like that personalized professional development and the opportunity to grow where we each individually need it um, allows us to connect with others who have those same goals and aspirations to grow in those areas and to do that as a team. And so we want to provide support across multiple areas. So our six main areas that we've kind of narrowed down to through a lot of work, um, about a year's worth of work actually, pre-pandemic even, are these areas. Growth mindset 
uh, coaching, continuous learning, collective efficacy, planning and reflecting, and then of course, professional learning communities. So when we talk about growth mindset, we basically agree that every person, whether it's a student or an educator, has the capacity to learn and grow, given opportunity, experience, and effort, and teaching and learning cultivate those abilities. So we believe that everyone has the opportunity to grow, no matter where they start, no matter where they came from, no matter what the circumstance, everyone has the opportunity to achieve their full potential and promise. We focus on coaching. Everyone deserves support to achieve at the highest levels and all professionals benefit from coaching. Um, we often talk about, you know, a professional athlete. It is a right of, um, a right and a pleasure to be coached every day. Yet for some reason in education, we sometimes feel that if we're being coached, it's because we did something wrong, right? Or it's evaluative. And it shouldn't feel that way. Like, I'm pretty sure LeBron James probably takes his coaches everywhere he goes. And maybe builds him a little playhouse like his daughter today. I don't know if you guys saw that article. It was pretty awesome. Um, but coaching is um, something that we all deserve so we can continuously grow, which brings us to the next category of continuous learning. So we're constantly trying to expand our content knowledge, our pedagogy, and our students as learners. Collective efficacy is essential, and that is the premise that we are all collectively responsible for the learning of all of our students, the improvement of our professional knowledge base, and everyone's effectiveness. So we're all in this together. Planning and reflecting, we agree that all highly effective teachers collaborate to purposefully plan, which is really important, for learning, and then take the time to reflect on that effectiveness and that cycle of continuous improvement to ensure that our students are in fact learning. And then finally, professional learning communities um, provide a group of educators that valuable time to meet regularly, share their expertise, plan lessons, and reflect on best practices. And so our goal is not just for this year, but for years to come, to live within these six zones of shared beliefs and to um, improve in every area and strengthen all of our schools, our teachers, and our district staff across the continuum um, in each of these major categories. And we referred to these as our shared beliefs about collaboration and continuous learning. Wait, Ms. Tisher, before you go on. Yes, ma'am. My growth mindset, I need to know what pedagogy is. I don't know what that is. So pedagogy is, I would call it the art of teaching. Oh, he Googled it. That's <laughs> what does it say? Does it say the art of teaching? It says the function or work of a teacher. There you go. The so teacher. I call it the art of teaching. Okay. The art but, or science of teaching. So there you go. There you go. It's not, it's everything that goes into teaching from the planning process to the actual delivery and facilitation of the learning to the reflection and the um, reevaluation of that process. There you go. So most recently, we've had a reflective activity with our IFs to assess where we are because we believe we need to know where we are um, in order to know where to go next. And so we have spent time discussing these three reflective questions. So what aspects of the collaboration or the collaborative so far have worked for you and how have those aspects positively impacted your school? What aspects of the collaborative should we re-examine? And then how should our future collaborative days be structured? Because we always want to make sure that we are maximizing the time of our instructional facilitators and our teachers as we continue through this work. Um, and we will use this data to make informed decisions as we move forward. If you all don't have any questions for me, I'm going to welcome Ms. Fink to the podium. And she is going to give an update of how we've been progressing through the development and enhancement of our district curriculum. Does anybody else have a question for me? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening. So Shannon talked a lot about the why behind the collaborative, and I'm here to talk about the how and what we're doing as part of our collaborative. So Dr. Cleveland um, introduced his five E's um, at the beginning of the year, and Evolve is one of those E's. And I think this really sums up what we are accomplishing through our collaborative with our instructional facilitators and now with the addition of some teachers. Um, 
we have evolved so much from the beginning of the year to where we are now. And we, we know that as the year continues to progress, we're only going to get better at our work. And so looking forward, we don't want to look backwards. We know that um, we had a rough start and some, we had some struggles at the beginning of the year with our remote lesson plan design. But I hope you see um, by the time I leave how far we've come. And, and I'm really excited to see where we will go because when we get to April, May, we will be so much further ahead in April or May than where we are right now. Then we'll look back and we'll fix, we'll revise and we'll vet our lessons. But I love this um, quote by Ted Sizer. The most important educational task of our times is to evolve the instructions and practices that assist learning. So blended lesson planning, our ifs and now teachers have protected time twice a month to develop lessons and our goal is to stay one to two weeks ahead of our teachers. And um, we have been able to creatively add teachers to our collaborative. And so elementary, we've been able to add 14 teachers to join this process. And secondary, we've been able to add 20 teachers to join this process. It is our goal that we're building the capacity of our teachers to be future building leaders and district leaders. And we really want to get input, input and feedback from them um, as to what's working well and what's not working well because we know that they're the consumers of the product that we're creating. So on your, um, at your seat, you had a checklist. It looks like this. very um, involved lesson planning checklist that I'm not going to share with you today, but I took some of the highlights from that checklist for you to view this lesson I'm about to show you through your lens. Um, our lesson plan design checklist follows the grades lesson design. I know that you've had some experience and some of you may have helped Dr. Smith present grades at a conference. And just a reminder that grades stands for goals, objectives, reading, activities, discussion, evaluation, and supports. We want all of our blended learning lessons to be on our district lesson design template. The reason for this is we want there to be consistency with our families. They're, they're the most important in this. If I'm a parent and I have children in four different buildings, we want this process to be as consistent as possible so there's not a lot of question about what the expectations are in our lessons. So as you're going through our district um, curriculum, K-12, you're going to see um, how consistent our lessons are um, and how aligned they are. We want there to be a teacher resource page in all of our lesson plan templates. We want teachers to, to be able to go and pull assignments. We want teachers to be able to go and grab what they need and load into their learning management systems. We want supports to be built into our lessons for our English language learners and our special education students. We want students to know what is expected of them to learn as a result of the lesson. We don't want it to be a question of why am I watching this? We want it to be explicit so that they understand what they're expected to learn. We want there to be direct instruction. Um, we know that, um, that just giving a student an activity or giving them an assignment to do without any teacher interaction sharing, you know, how to get the, how to, um, or what it is they're expected to do and what they're expected to, to know in order to be able to complete an activity is super important. And we want there to be checking for understanding, not just teachers checking for understanding, but we want students to self-assess as well. And then we want there to be technology tools, but not so many technology tools that it's overwhelming for students and for our families. So to get to our curriculum page, you will go to estill.org, to district, and then to curriculum. And you'll see this pop up. The buttons that you see are where our non, it's, it's where we house our traditional curriculum. And then underneath each of the buttons is where we are posting our weekly lessons for teachers to be able to grab and use um, for our remote learners. I also want to point out to you that we've added some new buttons. Um, we have ELD, our ESL department has been working um, continuously transforming our 
ELD curriculum to blended lessons so that our students who are learning remotely can access it. Um, GT has also created some curriculum and so we're adding their curriculum here as well as the adaptive curriculum that our special ed team has been working on for our special education students. So we're excited um, to be able to post the curriculum that's being designed in those areas. So bear with me, this keypad is really hard to maneuver. like the most sensitive <laughs> mouse I've ever worked in my life, okay? So. <laughs> Once you talk about sword oh, that's right. All right, so we're gonna go through a fourth grade math lesson, and as we're going through the different components of this lesson, I really want you to look at your checklist and see what evidence you find of that within our lessons. So, I have a quick question, yes. sorry. So this curriculum is just for remote students? Is, did I hear that right? Or? It, um, so yes and no. This is supposed to be used for our remote learners. However, at the end of the lesson, I will talk through if I was a, if I was a teacher, what pieces of this might I use with my face-to-face -face students? Okay. okay. So all of our lesson plan templates look very similar to this. The only difference you're going to find in our lesson plan templates would really be the color, and we've color coded all of our lesson plan templates to match the subject area. So math is green. We got to review really fast. <laughs> it's my kind of lesson right there. Miss <laughs> Tisher, how come you didn't have those when you taught my English class? All of our lesson plan templates have links to the days and so if I'm a student and I'm remote learning and I'm on my third day then I know I can go to day three and click and it's going to take me directly to that spot in the lesson plan template so I'm not having to scroll back through every day to find where I was the day before this is the teacher resource page and this is where everything that a teacher would need to assign into a learning management system is housed. And in this particular example, they have given very detailed explanations about exactly what teachers need to do in order to um, use these resources in learning management systems. Teachers can choose to use all of these, they can choose to use some of these, or they may choose to use none of these. They may have completely different activities that they want to do and that's okay. They can personalize these lessons however they see fit to meet the needs of the learners in their classrooms. Have you ever wanted to build something like a dog house or a birdhouse or a ramp for your bike? Well, if you have, then you have to know how to measure with a ruler or a measuring tape. What exactly do all the marks on the ruler mean? Well, this week you are going to learn all about the metric system for measuring length. The metric system is an easy way to measure because it's based on the power of 10. 
you will learn about millimeters, centimeters, meters, and kilometers in the next few days. Okay. So there's really no question to a student what it is that they're expected to learn in this lesson plan. This teacher used a lot of tools to create this video. She used a Google slide deck to create the, the pictures, and then she used the Google slide deck within a Screencastify to do the voiceover, and then she uploaded the whole Screencastify and embedded it into this lesson plan template. Take a second and think, what is the same about these two rulers? What is different about these two rulers? After you've thought about it for a minute, click on the Padlet picture to share what you noticed about the two different rulers. Okay, so Padlet is a technology tool that a lot of teachers are familiar with. And this is a sample of the Padlet. So if I was a teacher and I was using this in my lesson, I would just need to make a copy of this and assign it to my class. What this really does is for our students who are learning remotely from home, this allows them to have engagement and discussion with other students in the classroom who may be working on site or who may be working remotely at home because all of the responses of the students would be recorded here. And so they would be able to go in and read and interact with what other students were responding um, with these discussion questions. What do you know about measuring length? Listen to the song about the metric system. Numberop.com's complete digital library of math videos is now available ad-free and child-safe at numberop.com. In support of distance learning, we're offering a 30-day free trial for all new members. Let's rock math at numberop.com. Schoolhouse Rock from when you're when you were a kid. You know, you're, I'm a Bill. I'm a Bill on Capitol Hill. Well, as you know, as a former teacher and as a principal, I really see the value in music and teaching kids through music. And I really feel like this is a very engaging song for students to um, be engaged in and to be learning because, I, you know, when I learn stuff through music, then I'm able to easily um, recall that. And so, throughout this lesson, you're going to find that this video is repeated and repeated and repeated so that students have repeated exposure to it. And honestly, if I was a teacher and I was teaching my face-to-face -face kids, this would be a tool I would pull out of this lesson and share with my students. You are, you are, go you are going to go on a measurement hunt. You're going to go on a hunt around your house to find things that are about one millimeter one centimeter, one meter, and one kilometer. For that one, um, you'll just have to brainstorm some things because that's the largest one. I want you to create a chart on your paper and jot down the things you find. If you can't find anything, just brainstorm some things that might be that size. If you need to, go back and listen to the song again to get some ideas. So another tool I'm gonna point out is in the corner, there's a kind of a timer going. It kind of helps students pace themselves as they're going through these activities um, so that they're not spending a whole lot of time on this one slide. Click on the Ed. Okay, so that's just asking them to click on the Ed Puzzle. It's a voiceover of the directions, but I do wanna show you an Ed Puzzle because this is a technology tool that the district purchased for our teachers this year. What Ed Puzzle does is it allows teachers to either pull in some created Ed Puzzles from other educators, or they can drop in a YouTube video into Ed Puzzle and create one as well. And what Ed Puzzle does, it'll show a portion of a video, and then as a teacher, you can stop the video and you can ask questions, and then the students can 
um, answer the questions and if they get it wrong, sometimes it doesn't allow them to go on. They've got to go back and rewatch that portion of the video until they get the right answer. So this is just a really good way for students to self-assess or um, if, if teachers wanted to assign this into their learning management system, it's a good assessment tool for the teachers as well. So I'm just gonna show you just a little clip of the Ned Puzzle video. Hi, let's learn about metric length. We can measure how long things are, or how tall, or how far apart they are. The most common measurements are millimeters, centimeters, meters, and kilometers. How big is it? Okay, so you, as you can tell, this is not one that our teachers created. They went in and pulled this because it was totally relevant to the lesson that they were creating. And at the bottom, I don't know if you noticed or not, but there were little teardrops at the bottom. That shows the teacher where the video is going to stop, and then that's where they can add questions in. If they could take things out, they can put things in. But again, this is just a really good tool for either students to self-assess their understanding or for teachers to assess um, if students are understanding what they're learning. How do our teachers learn how to use the software and make these lessons? So that started this summer with Dr. Smith. She sent out daily or weekly tech tips and tools. And so we focused on the ones we knew we were gonna be using first. Um, we've done a lot of um, training through our collaborative of our instruction facilitators, and now that we're onboarding our teachers as well, um, they're getting um, a lot of exposure to it. What we've learned is that there are thousands of tech tools out there. We know that. Um, and what we're trying to teach people as we're designing these lessons is that we don't want to overwhelm people with all these tech tools. But if I'm a teacher and there's a tech tool I love, but it may not be as familiar, with other teachers it is, as it is to me, if I wanna use it, then I make a copy of the lesson and then I can embed that tech tool and I can use that as a teacher. But we're really just trying to keep it simple with Edpuzzle, Screencastify, um, Padlet, Jamboard, and Flipgrid would be our five big ones. But there are thousands of tools out there that teachers could embed into their own lessons if they wanted to. Use what you so that's just another voiceover. If I click the little audio icon, it would continue to read that. But this is where the students can go in. And this is in the teacher resource, on the teacher resource slide, the teacher can grab this, this activity and they can load this into the learning management system. And so this is an assignment that students could work on. So if I was a teacher and I am teaching on-site face-to-face kids, this may be an activity that I wanna do after I've done a direct teach with my student. And as students are working in their learning management system, which they did pre-pandemic to submit their work, then I could be pulling groups of kids and working with them one-on-one -on -one and the skills that they need. Can I? Can I use measurement to help me solve problems? Rate yourself. A one means I need help. A two, uh, I need just a little help. A three, I got it. A four, I got it and I can teach it to a friend. How would you rate yourself? So just another little self-assessment tool for students to ask themselves, can I use measurement to help me solve problems? And for them to be reflective on where they are in their learning. Are you ready? Are you ready for a challenge? Here are three options that you can choose from if you would like more work working with met metric length. So going back to that whole revising editing, there are really only two options here, but um, this teacher, when she was designing um, this lesson plan template, recognized that we had kids that would want some kind of an extension activity. And so she's, she's included into her lesson plan design two different ways that students can extend their learning if they choose to. Also in our lesson plan templates, we want students to know when their day is finished. And so we've embedded these big huge stop signs directing them back to the learning management system. And that way they can check their LMS to see are there assignments I need to complete for this day's lesson. And I'm not gonna go through the Click on now it's But I want you to um, see another way that they're having students self-assess. 
Now it's time for you to practice. On a piece of paper, I want you to make a T-chart. On one side, I want you to label it meters. On the other side, I want you to label it centimeters. See if you can figure out the missing numbers in the table. So I'm a student, I work through this, and I'm done, and I'm like, okay, did I do this, did I do it right? And so I loved what this teacher did. So students now have instant immediate feedback on whether or not they understood what it was that they were doing. So I thought this was a really good way for, um, for students to have that self-assessment piece embedded in to their practice. Are there any questions or anything that you want to talk about? Um, did we hit all of those things on the checklist? With, with all this online stuff that we're doing now, have we noticed um, any malicious stuff, people trying to break into our system, messing with our... I have not had any reports of you, Shannon, Parkinson. Mm -hmm. I know people are always looking for a way to try to do bad things to computer systems and get people through the computers. And the, only, um, the only thing I've heard since we've really gone virtual is Zoom was being hacked on a regular basis. I know the ADE had when it, several of their meetings were hacked. I know some of our elementary schools had a PTA meeting that was hacked. And so Zoom has now put in um, precautions and they've put in safeguards to prevent that from happening. So if you're hosting a Zoom meeting, you either have to allow your participants in or they have to have a passcode to enter. So I think it's more difficult now for a Zoom meeting to be hacked. That's all I've heard. Good. So our teach, all of our teachers across the district are doing this, and that's what you're talking about. Everybody's on the same page. So we are working in our collaborative. We give them two days a month to work on this, and so our instructional facilitators have been busy bees working and we've been able to onboard some teachers to help support this work, and we're really excited about the teachers coming on. I really feel like this is giving them an opportunity to have a lot of um, input and feedback and um, you know, really learn about this process. So as they're going back and they're working with grade level teachers, then they can have conversations about this as well. But I guess if a teacher wanted to do their own, they could, or are they absolutely. supposed to do this? Absolutely. Okay. So we let them know they can, they can either create their own, they can make a copy and gut it and use some of it and throw some of it out, mm -hmm. um, or they can make a copy and use it and exactly as, as, as long as if they're doing their own, it meets, it meets the, the same standards. objectives and all that edge standards. Correct. It meets the, the grade level standards. Other questions feedback we welcome feedback from you so um, if you go home and you get on our curriculum website and you have questions please reach out to us and we'll um, try to answer those for you back to our board meeting <laughs> good job Miss Fink Miss Fisher I did look how I was jumping okay all right um, Ms. Hutton, do you want to come join me? So I wanted to give you an update on a grant that we received. I know I sent you an email telling you that we'd received this grant. Um, it is the SOAR grant, and SOAR stands for Successful Outcomes for Arkansas Readers. It's formerly known as the Comprehensive Literacy and State Development Grant, but this was a $200,000 grant that we received from the Arkansas Department of Education um, to support literacy initiatives in our district. 
when we wrote this grant, we wrote it to focus on four schools that are targeted needs assistance or at risk of being targeted needs assistance for special education population. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it is a grant that is um, for $200,000 over a two year period. So year one, we're, we're working with Elmdale, Jones, Smith and Westwood because Elmdale and Jones are targeted needs assistance schools and Smith and Westwood are at risk of being targeted needs assistance. And then year two, we're gonna be focusing on Parson Hills, Sonora Elementary, Bayari and Lee. And our vision is, is that we really wanna create a science of reading lab in each of our schools to provide personalized reading intervention in the area, or a personalized reading intervention for our special education students. And our priority goal is that by May 2021, Elmdale, Jones, Smith, and Westwood will all meet the SPED ESSA target score. Woo <laughs> um, so I've asked Ms. Hutton to come and kind of share her perspective as the building principal of one of these schools. I've kind of given you the why and she's gonna give you the how. Okay, thank you for this opportunity and the grant is gonna be amazing. So the first thing I wanna talk about is um, collaborating, which you've heard so much of it tonight. But the first thing, we have a district monthly district meeting to network and talk about the progress that we are making on the grant, meaning the principals all get together with Ms. Fink, with the um, special ed TOSA. The last time we met, we also were allowed to bring a partner with us to also do some brainstorming. Not only that, we had to create what's called a STAR team, which is, means special, a special education team accomplishing reading results. And that team also collaborates at each building and we look at each piece of the grant and work together to, make, to accomplish the goals that we wanna accomplish. Not only that, but today, <laughs> Ms. Fink and I, talked with another district about this grant because their district is in trouble of going into, they are in targeted school improvement for their SPED kids too, and they wanted to know what we were doing. So we were able to share this, the, all the components of this grant with them so that maybe they could use some of them to help them grow too. So basically, we're going to be collaborating in the building, in the district, and maybe even outreaching to other places which is building capacity for all of us. And then we're gonna have the opportunity to collect precise data. We have already started this process and basically what it is, is it's taking the science of reading components, the phonetic awareness pieces, we have been giving a, prescri a prescription. Here is exactly what you're going to test. Here is a spreadsheet for you to put it in. Once you get your data in here, the data shows you how the kids score and it will give you a nice little um, slate of color, red, green, and yellow. So on each skill that is tested, it will show us where the kids are for each skill in the phonemic, phonemic awareness uh, pacing. And so, What's going to happen is we're going to create a co-teaching method where a special educator and the reg regular educator will work together to meet the needs of the students within the classroom. The special educator will work with the, on these skills. They will, the special educator will work with each special ed student when they come for their services for pullout on the specific skills that they are not meeting. How, how are they gonna know what to do? Well, that's another prescriptive item that um, the team has come up with. Basically, we have a document. You pull the document up, it has the assessment piece. So you have, for example, um, phonemic awareness, you scored red in it. The, teacher, the teacher's going, well, what do I do now? Well, you move over to the next column and it has multiple strategies that the teacher can put in place or the interventionist or anybody that's going to work with that child, it's prescriptive. So you work with that child on that specific skill or if there's another child within there that has the same skill deficit, you work with that child 
for two or three weeks on that specific skill, and then you retest them in three weeks to see if they've mastered that skill. So they're going to get this practice in multiple ways. They'll work in the classroom with their teacher, getting specific interventions, coach through the special ed teacher. They will get the intervention with the special ed teacher for the pull-in class, and we're going to create a reading lab. After our last meeting, we were thinking at Elmdale, we were going to make one reading lab, but what we discovered is that we could also make a reading lab within the special ed class. So, we all have an opportunity to do this any way that we want to, but in order for us to make sure that all of our SPED kids are getting what they need, we want to make sure that they have all the resources and everything they need when they are in the SPED class, but we also want another place where we can provide ongoing interventions for all of the SPED kids and other kids that can benefit from this as well, ongoing throughout the days when they are not being served within the SPED class and when they're not being served with the SPED teacher in the classroom doing the co-teaching. So it, the kids are gonna get multiple opportunities to um, learn these skills and continue on. And again, our goal is to get through all the phonological awareness skills with every SPED kid so that they are going to have the foundation to be able to read. With this grant, we also have the opportunity to get some great professional development. I don't know if you know what Phonics First is, but it's like, it's like the ultimate um, strategy to help kids learn to read. It has everything that the science of reading has taught us. It has every everything you could want to do to teach phonetic awareness. And so four people in every building is going to get this training. The training costs over $1,000 per teacher because you're going to get the supplies and everything you need as well as the training to implement the findings first. Okay? We're also doing like individual studies in our buildings um, to get professional development. Some of us are doing book stud studies. Some will do research and do webinars. Some may even seek out some co-teaching training. But we have multiple opportunities and the funds to get the training that we need to implement this grant. One of the great things in, in it is the parent involvement piece. And so we want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our SPED kids that are at school five days a week, three days a week, two days a week, and our kids that are at home. And so in order to do that, our parents are going to have to know how to help their kids with those skills that they're working on. In order to do that, one of the things that we would like to do is make parent videos. Simple, friendly language, a teacher sitting next to one child working on a specific skill to teach the parents how they can also teach that skill. It can be as simple as a video of, here's how you pair read. Here's how you use a blending board. And it will just show a teacher with their blending board and going over the letters and how you're supposed to do that the correct way. We also think it's important for um, the parents to understand about attendance. Why? Because if the kids are not at school and they're not attending, then we can't intervene and help our kids make progress. And they're a big part of that. And so, um, I don't know if you all have ever seen Connection Corners before, but I have a social worker and a, and a counselor who are amazing stars at our school, and um, they're making videos for social-emotional learning and everything you can dream of for our kids to see weekly. And so they're going to make a video for the whole district that's going to talk about the importance of kids coming to school, what does at-risk mean, um, just everything that we know about attendance, um, strategies to bring them to school, and um, we're going to publish that so that everyone can see that, just because we need our kids to be at school. And as you know, on the ESSA report, <laughs> attendance is on there. And we all know if our kids are not at school, we cannot teach them. So um, we, are, we are also going to have the opportunity to um, hire an interventionist in each building 
that interventionist can provide the another person to, um, to provide more interventions for the same students. So they're getting all of this throughout the day. And then we could have somebody come in after school and provide more interventions for the same students as they're going along, different skills as they master them. And so um, that's gonna be amazing. That interventionist will be in the reading lab. Well, what's a reading lab, you say? Well, the reading lab can be just about anything you want it to be, but what we're thinking is, we wanna provide all the resources that a person would need to teach the phonetic awareness skills that they're gonna need. And so that means they're gonna need a phonics first kit. They may need um, lips, which you may not know, but it's a sounding board. And it's a board that has all the letters and all the sounds and even shows how the mouth is formed. That needs to be posted. We need decodable books available, just everything possible. There's multi-sensory manipulatives for literacy, like for example, just taking some gel, putting it in a bag, taping it all up and putting it down and the kids are practicing the letter O. And just because it's a nice, fun little thing, they're gonna like doing that. Or it could be a salt tray where they're just making the letters or they're making the sounds. Or it can just be manipulatives. Just three yellow manipulatives that they use for when they're, when they're sounding words out. Push them up and sound them out and say it. So just simple things like that. We're also going to be making take home bags for every student. And in those bags, the same things that will be in the reading lab, they will have in their little bag, it could be a big bag, it depends on what we put in there, but though they will have those at home. The parents will have the videos and the parents can help them through the videos with the manipulatives. Am I forgetting anything? Okay. And that's about what it covers, but I gotta tell you, it's gonna be so prescriptive. It's very systematic. I'm very excited to get this implemented in our building. I just think that we'll have a lot of success because it's like you do this, if you don't know this, you go to this page and it tells you exactly what you need to do. You do this and in three weeks, you reassess them and you determine what you need to do next. And it's the same thing, go to the next assessment and do the prescribed um, strategies. It's, very, it's, it's gonna be awesome. We've got great buy-in, and um, I can't wait to see what it looks like in every building because what's great about this grant is that we have the flexibility to make it what it needs to be in each of our buildings. Mm -hmm. Any questions? So it would appear you're pretty excited about it. I'm very excited. <laughs> 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 I appreciate the detail and the passion. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. Great. Good job. Thank you. Good evening. I don't know that I'm quite as passionate about my items, but I'm not sure they're as exciting as Ms. Hutton's are. Oh, no, come uh, on. But we'll try. Um, the first item on your agenda is Title IX Procedures. You'll probably remember that last month you updated several policies based on the new Title IX regulations that came out from the U.S. Department of Education in August. So these Title IX procedures are a companion document. Um, if you open them and looked at them, you probably thought, oh my goodness, that's a lot of very legally type language. Um, in full disclosure, I collaborated with my friend and colleague who's the attorney for Bryant School District, and um, the feedback that he and I exchanged is we need to make these less legally, but we just couldn't get to a way to do that. Um, the procedures are basically the user manual um, if and when we had to investigate and look into a Title IX grievance. That's why they go into the detail that they do because it, we want it to be a very thorough um, transparent process. They will not be official policy, but they do require board approval and we'll post them on our website as well um, for the public to access if needed. Do you have any questions about the procedures? Well, I won't be the official policy. 
Because the policy are the documents that you approved last month. Last month. Okay. Um, these are procedures which won't go in the official. So these 20 some odd pages won't go into um, the employee handbook or the policy okay. manual, but they will be board approved procedures. Got it. Any other questions? Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to accept the Title IX procedures. There's a motion by Mr. Emerson and a second by Mr. Bell to accept the Title IX procedures as presented. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Okay, the next two slides offer a, an update on the district's Title IX, or not Title IX, sorry, we're done with Title IX. COVID-19, both have a nine in them. Um, response. So as we've been talking about this as the pandemic's progressed, um, you have asked for some data as far as um, quarantines, spread, things of that nature. It's a little bit difficult to get this data for us because when we're collecting the information, we're looking at who's been, who's a positive, who's been around them, and we're looking from more of the quarantine uh, perspective versus um, how they were infected and things of that nature. But here's the data as best we can present it. And in full disclosure, this is from August 24th through Sunday. Um, so anything that came through yesterday or today is not included. And it starts on August 24th because that's when school started. And that's when our reporting and tracing procedures really went into to place as school started. So the first bullet point, every school has now had at least one positive case. Up until last week, that was not true. Um, but now every school in the district has had a positive case. There have been 179 students and staff that have tested positive from August 24th through Sunday, October 11th. I will say there is a, a bit of a limitation to that number. So those students and staff are those that have been on our campus this school year. So there are some students that um, are virtual students that may have tested positive, but because they haven't been on our campus, we're not going through the process of <laughs> who they've been in contact with because it's not our students and not our staff. But it's still counting. They still count. I believe the health department is still counting them, um, but they are not included in this number. Not in this number. They are not included in this number. The county numbers or yeah, I, I would yeah. assume so, they're just because I don't think they're making that distinction. So what that equals to is 0.79% of the 22,800 students and staff that have been on campus. Where that 22,800 comes from is um, pre-K through 12, we have um, 22,700 students approximately, and then we have about 2,900 staff. So when you add those together, you get 25,600, but then you have to subtract out the 2,800 via students. So that's where that, um, that 22,800 on-campus students and staff number comes from. So 60 staff members have tested positive of the 2,900 staff members that we have. You'll see the percentage there is 2.07%. 119 students have tested positive. Um, and again, those are our on-campus students. So I didn't include the VIA students because our, although they are our students, we don't have to go through the process that we do with other students. So that is 0.6% of the 19,900 on-campus students. The 2,900 staff, that's teachers, that's lunch ladies, janitors, everybody. Everybody. Anybody who is employed by Springdale School District is included in that number. So as a part of the process that we talked about last month of identifying probable close contacts, um, you know that that's anybody who was within six feet for 15 or more minutes of a known positive, regardless of if they were wearing a mask or not. We've identified 1,298 people who were probable close contacts. So that includes students and staff, 
and those 1,298 people were quarantined for the required time period based on exposure. Now, that next bullet point, out of those 1,298 PCCs, probable close contacts, nine of those have tested positive. So you'll see that's 0.69%. Now, I will say in full disclosure, these are the numbers that we're able to identify going through the process. Were other people exposed, possibly, that didn't get identified? Um, did some people test positive and not know that they were exposed to another positive? Possibly. But based on no the... No can determine that. W right. We don't have a way. But I just want you to know that the way that we came up with that nine of the 1,298 is comparing the positive list versus the PCC list. Yeah. So there's some, there may be some limits there, uh, but this is how we're best able to determine. Yeah. So of those nine um, PCCs that tested positive, there was one student-to-staff transmission, one staff-to-staff, -staff, and seven student-to-student. -student. All of those student-to-student -student were at the secondary level for middle school and up. One thing that the health department and DESE began to ask us to do starting last week was fill out an impact survey. They're asking that it's done weekly. And so um, nurse Kathy Launder and Monica Witchen, who are heading up uh, and doing the lion's share of work and identifying and making all these phone calls to the, pri the uh, probable close contacts um, are completing this survey. We'll be able to, every Friday, send you this information, and we'll also look at posting this on our website because some people have asked for this information. But as of Friday, there were 12 staff and 22 students in isolation. What isolation means is that a person is sick and the sick person is removing themselves from others. There were 24 staff and 320 students in quarantine. What that means is those people have been exposed and they are removing themselves from other in case, others in case they get sick. So there's a bit of a distinct distinguishment there. Um, the people in quarantine may be in quarantine because we identified them to quarantine or they may be in quarantine because of exposures that have happened in their, their personal and private lives. So every Friday as this information is gathered sent into the state, we'll be able to send it to you and we'll find a place on our website to post that as well. This is a constantly moving number, so every day it's gonna change, so it'll offer a weekly snapshot of where we are. Yep. This does not include people who just self-quarantine, like if you're on a sports team and you're not wanting to get stuck not being able to play golf. Because I know that that's, that's happened. Some have decided to go virtual for a couple weeks before their big state championship. Right. Count I don't right. believe that those students um, are included in that, but I'll get some clarification. That's not. I wouldn't think they would be, but I'm just right. I don't. I don't think that they are, but I'll make sure. So those are my two snapshots of of where we are um, today. What questions do you have? So I've got a comment. Okay. Just, just to compare numbers, the Dallas school district has 994,000 kids and they've got they're reporting on right, roughly 915,000 and they're at 0.89 mm -hmm. and we were at 0.79 or 69 so it's very very yeah, similar yeah students 0.6 yeah and they're obviously oh, yeah. huge mm -hmm. but it, it's kind they're of around the same yeah. yeah statistically similar I'm just confused on, I mean, the governor kept saying that the health department was going to do, all, make some of these calls and do all of these steps and follow-ups. I haven't seen any, and I've had multiple children that have either been potential contact or have had to be tested, and even after being tested and getting negative results, we still aren't hearing anything from the state. I mean, so... I mean, are we as a district hearing anything other than, hey, do this and this and this for us? Um, so we haven't heard to do anything different than we were initially trained on identifying the probable close contacts and sending that to the health department, which we do. Um, 
when school first started and we realized that that health department piece of coming behind the school district and following up with those PCCs was not happening, um, Dr. Cleveland and some other superintendents in the area kind of said, hey, you know, this, there's a breakdown in the process. And for, it seems like about a week or so, um, we saw some activity with the contact tracers calling and whatnot. Um, so two things, one, anecdotally, um, my son was quarantined the first week of school and we did finally get a call from a contact tracer, but it was after he was already back at school and they were missing pieces of information. So it wasn't an effective process for us. Um, we're also seeing from the employee standpoint, when employees are quarantined due to outside exposure and they're trying to get us some sort of documentation that says, yes, I really had to quarantine, um, it, that's becoming very difficult to do because they are not being, they're not even on the health department's radar. So they're not getting a phone call. They're not on our records because it was outside exposure. So um, I think that the contact tracing piece from the health department continues to, it's just not there. to be either it's slow or non-existent. So if a, if a teacher has to quarantine, does that, it doesn't affect like their sick days or anything like that, does it? Eventually it could. So there are two pieces of COVID leave laws um, that would apply first. So there's state, a state enacted COVID leave for employees who were either positive, identified as a close contact or have symptoms and are seeking diagnosis. Um, there are 10 days available for those three reasons. And then there are also an additional 10 days available through federal, the CARES Act um, implemented some legislation that would be an additional 10 days. There are specific reasons that would have to be met, but it's very similar to the state. So um, an employee could have 20, day, 20 work days mm -hmm. of leave before they would have to go into um, sick days okay. and then, or vacation days or whatever accrued leave that they have. Okay. I have a question. So I think last month you mentioned that, I think it was the state of Wyoming, mm -hmm. that they were not requiring the quarantines if both people were wearing a mask. And as we get more data, is there any discussion like at the state level or anything about maybe changing that procedure? Because the feedback I've had from teachers is that the positives aren't the problem right now. It's all the kids that are out for quarantine that, you know, like our percentage of positive on that's a half a percent or a little more than half a percent. Um, so if we could hone that number down to something that was you know, more realistic, and I'm not saying that's not realistic, but it, it seems to be, and I'd be interested to see what Dallas with their 900 and how many ever thousand students, 14,000, like what they were experiencing on it, because, you know, if we could avoid as much disruption as possible of having, you know, 1300 students out, like, is that something that is being talked about? I don't um, know. Um, so when, when I saw that Wyoming guidance that they had changed their requirements for quarantine, that if a person was exposed to a positive in the K-12 educational setting and both parties were wearing a mask, that the obviously the person who was positive would have to go home. But all the people who were exposed would not have to go home as long as they weren't symptomatic. Um, we, Dr. Cleveland and I shared that with Secretary Key um, I didn't hear anything back from him, but uh, we shared it with him. <laughs> Keep pushing um, the information. And, you know, honestly, as I was compiling this data, I thought we need to share this at the state level. Yeah. Um, I think Springdale might be in a unique position to have enough um, people yeah. that That's makes cool. the data relevant. And so I would like to, to share this at the state level and see um, if we can get some feedback about conversations that are happening, you know, maybe as we start a new semester, um, you know, at least start the conversation of what we're seeing um, and see if, if other districts across the state are seeing the same things that we are. Yeah, and I, I agree with what you just said. That was going to be my next point, that with our size, you know, as the largest, the uh, well, the, the, just the numbers, mm -hmm. you know, to make it statistically um, significant to share that. Right, yes, I think we will continue to, to share that till somebody listens, maybe. Because <laughs> I was with you, we were quarantined the first week of the year. <laughs> right. It's not fun. Yeah. No, it's not. Thank well, you. Great work. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome.
And it's still also the practice that if you do have it positive, you actually can return back to the classroom quicker mm -hmm. than the fourth. So I think it's 10 days. Mm -hmm. That's kind of an oxymoron. In it's itself, it's anyway. odd, and I mean, I, I have to kind of. I think we need to keep pushing that that issue as well, because. I mean, because no matter how many negative tests, I mean, because yeah. they're still making them. I mean, that yeah. makes no sense. Yes. Yeah, so, what is what is the quarantine right now? Fourteen. Days. Um, if you're if you're quarantined, then you have to stay home fourteen days from last exposure. If you test positive, you stay home 10 days from your positive test as long as you are not symptomatic. For two days. Fever free for two days and yeah. not symptomatic without so a negative test. You can get in situations, and we've had this, where um, people are almost, well, employees who have gone and taken multiple tests trying to test positive so that they could come back Quickly. sooner, yeah. which is, it's, it's odd. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. I got to some of this before I trip this Jeremy thing up here. <laughs> okay, guys. Good evening. Um, I wanted to go over October 1 enrollment. You know, that's a benchmark that um, is widely used across our state. You can see that our uh, number in K-12 was down 281 when compared to October 1 of last year. Um, if you look a little closer, you can see that uh, kindergarten is uh, 225 down. So um, perhaps families that whose child was old enough to attend kindergarten decided because of the pandemic to delay that start for a year. So we could be in for a bigger kindergarten than normal next year. Um, I know our uh, homeschool enrollment is up slightly. I don't think uh, it's a, a tremendous amount, but it is it is up somewhat. So those two reasons, I think, are the primary reasons that we're down, comparatively speaking, to this time last year. Um, this is unusual for Springdale. It hasn't happened in 40 plus years, I don't believe. So new territory for us here. You can see there was a very significant drop in our pre-K enrollment. Um, once again, same thing, I, we, we think. Parents are just a little uh, anxious about sending their little ones to uh, school. Um, and so, um, yeah. So any questions for me on our, our enrollment? We, I haven't seen any numbers yet on district, dist, I mean, uh, state numbers to see, I think that probably a lot, the majority of the districts are down slightly. Mm -hmm. So that'll be interesting when all that comes out. Okay, and then the, the next item I have for you, this was just a little letter that I had prepared. Um, as, you knew, as you know, we were very anxious about, uh, because October 1 has traditionally been the date that our free and reduced percentage is set. 70% is the magic number. We didn't know, we were very anxious about how we were gonna get there since all of our students are eating free uh, right now, regardless of income. As well, we have a number of our free and reduced students who are learning virtually, so they're not even coming onto campus. And so we were very anxious. Uh, the state uh, recognized that for all the districts in the state. So what they said was, we could look at the children that were still eating on last year's status and then everyone that had completed a new application and add those together. Uh, and so by doing that, it did push us back over the 70%. So our uh, ESA dollars will be around the same as they were this year, approximately 16.6 .6 million. So that is a Wonderful. huge one. So the federal government's paying for everybody's lunch through the end of the year, we know that. Yes, it, it's through, through the December. end of December and it was just revised through the end of June now. Oh, June so it's going through the whole school year. Mm -hmm. so my, that was going to be my next question is what happens January 1 when they're not paying for, do we have to go through this? Right, no, it's been extended okay. for the entire school year now. Okay, well, that's, that's a woohoo moment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good for kids. Yeah. So uh, anyway, that's great news for us. And so I uh, wanted to be sure and share that all with you as well. Any questions for me? 
Thank you very much. Thank you. There you go. That's all right. I got it. He needs no introduction. Yeah, so I've got a short <laughs> construction update for you guys. <laughs> Maybe. So one of the projects we're working on is the fueling station and transportation. Um, they've got all the conduits in for the electrical upgrades, got the awning up, and then we actually have the pumps in. So they're um, getting everything wired up. They should be laying asphalt down tomorrow. So you it's moving ahead. Of, at once? Yeah, you'll be able to. Yep, you'll be able to fuel, fuel four um, vehicles at one time. That's great. So it, it's moving ahead of schedule. Actually, weather's been good, and that's uh, the new uh, diesel tank, sixteen thousand gallons. Oh, help us. So yeah. That's awesome. um, so Don Tyson School of Innovation Phase Two. This is in the lobby of the PAC. So they're they're getting the floors going. Um, this is the exterior um, on the south side of the PAC. Um, this is the interior. That's actually the stage that's open. Um, they'll be taking the scaffolding down this week in the uh, auditorium. <clears throat> so Springdale High School, and these pictures are from yesterday. So they actually started laying block today. So they've got walls going up over there. Um, Harbor Wrestling. This is five o'clock one morning. That's when they started pouring the slab on that. And then that's the, the finished slab. So it has to cure for 10 days. Um, Harbor Baseball, they all have the plumbing going in. Um, they're getting ready to start block work over there as soon as they finish Springdale Highs. So it's, it's moving pretty quickly. Um, we're adding the parking lot. Um, by the indoor, so they've got it dug out and they're laying it out right now. So that'll be moving pretty quickly also. And then the Tawny Town Elementary, we started last Monday actually moving dirt. And uh, I was over there today and they actually have some steel. They're tying together, they're getting ready to, do, to dig footings on the pad. So this, this is looking down Fletcher back to the east. So they've made a, a tremendous amount of progress out there in just a little over a week. And that, that is all I have. If you guys have any questions, I can answer. How are we on water bother fillers? So they are working on them. They started uh, last Thursday. Okay. Um, they're gonna be a little more work than we thought, but, but they're working on them. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And what about the, I know someone I think sent you the um, adaptions for the uh, water fountains that would make them water bottle fillers, but someone said we couldn't use them because it wasn't um, compliant. Um, they make a retrofit that right. you can put onto a bubbler that mm -hmm. makes it a bottle filler. We can use them, we just have to disable the bubblers, which we've already done. Okay. Um, some of our schools, um, the style bubblers that they have in, they don't have a, a uh, retrofit okay. for those. And then we only have three schools that have uh, that different style of a bottle filler. Okay. Um, we have, you know, we went through and put bottle fillers in every school, just a few. Mm -hmm. We're going back on round two, adding more at the high schools and the junior high levels. So. We're in the process of getting that done also. Chair, before you leave, I think the board probably heard about our Press 15 having maybe bleached some clothing. Sure. And, and you tried to reduce that in, in the past and it just didn't work real well. Could you tell them what the fix has been? Because yeah. I think some of them may even have family members that have <laughs> maybe had some clothing that was bleached mm -hmm. away. So yeah, uh, we decided in the beginning go with fresh 15 it's a little easier for the teachers to use they don't have to to wipe it down they can just spray it and leave it well we started running into the problems with it bleaching out clothes and 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 just build up so we've decided and, and we've already started we started last uh, thursday switching everything over to a quad based uh, disinfectant so 
um, we sent an email out. I worked with the CNI team to get with all the principals, and then uh, uh, Wayne Buttram's going to go. He's meeting with the principals the day we change it out mm -hmm. to show them how to apply the the new clock based chemicals, and and then get a plan to get the teachers. We have to get their bottles. So so we're, we're using the brush 15. We'll still be using it in the custodial department to atomize at night. Mm -hmm but we're gonna have the teachers use a clot based uh, cleaner. And the main reasons it, it won't leach out clothes, fade them, and um, it has a five minute contact kill time mm -hmm. where the F Fresh 15 had 10. But they'll have to actually apply it on with a rag or paper towels, so. There was some uh, conversation about the clot stat five being potentially harmful, especially to those that are potentially pregnant or pregnant. Is that still accurate or is it diluted we, to the point that it's not accurate? Yeah, we had concerns about it and the way we um, provide the, the Quatstat 5, it's diluted 256 parts to one. So it, it's safe once it's diluted out um, and we, okay. we're we comfortable with, with the, the dilution and every, all the Quatstat that we use is diluted and we've used it in the district for over 15 years. So it's not anything new, it's just new to the teachers. Okay. Uh, custodians have used it for 15 years. Thank you, I just wanted to make sure, because I, I believe y'all probably had some conversations about that. Before. Yeah, we, we've had a few emails since we started the changeover. And it's not a bad idea anyway to switch out your sanitizers. Yeah. You get too much build up of one, you need to switch into quaternary ammonia is good. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not a new chemical or anything. Yeah, it's, a good it's all on the EPA list, mm -hmm. the the end list. So, um, but all right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Hello. Good evening. Oh, whoa. Getting the end of this, I think. It's good to be here with you all tonight. Um, and just talk some about how SEA has been supporting the teachers in our district. We had our meeting tonight. We're meeting um, via Zoom. And it was just so nice to see so many educators who are um, so dedicated and committed to our students. And our teachers in Springdale are just awesome. They just are. Um, but SEA has been working hard to support them. And Renee has gotten to do a lot of the, the, fun, the fun things that we've been doing for teachers. Um, we've delivered masks to 14 schools, to teachers in 14 schools who requested some extra masks for their students. And Renee got to take those. And um, we've been delivering our scholarship money to our new educators. Um, from, and the, the really nice thing about that is that it's been arranged from all different grade levels. So thank you, Mr. Emerson, Ms. Creek, for that. Um, they are so grateful and very appreciative. Um, and Renee is going to just visit with you guys for a few minutes about how she can be a resource for you guys. Ren this is Renee Johnson, our UNICERF director. So I will let her. be brief I just wanted to come introduce myself because y'all may see me around sometimes and I'll be at board meetings um, this past week I went to the 14 different buildings and introduced myself to principals and everyone was so warm and welcoming and we had great conversations um, a little bit about my background is that I was a teacher a sped teacher in Cabot and like Corey I was the local president um, I worked with AEA at the state level advocating for um, students with special needs and for teachers and so that's how I got involved and they eventually recruited me for this um, UNICERF position. This will be my second year being a UNICERF director. Um, I had to bring my notes in case I forgot all about me. <laughs> <laughs> but my role as the state level UNICERF director but working here is to bring resources from our national and our state association to the local to support teachers in any way that we can. And here we have a partnership with the school districts as well so that we can collaborate and 
think of things that we could do to help together. Um, we've brainstormed some things already, and I can't wait to see what, um, what we do with those ideas. Um, right now, AEA is working on gathering data on um, the workload, the workload that teachers are facing, and the impact that waivers have had toward that. And um, in a month or so, I may be able to come back and share that data. You will probably see it published. Um, but just how the waivers impact um, the teachers, which impact students, and and how we could help support um, in that way. So that's all I wanted to share tonight. Thank you. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. I don't see anybody. Patrons. Any patrons? Yeah. With that, thanks for a great evening, and we're adjourned.